Thank you all. There we are. There you go. So now I'll take some vows. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mandy, uh, for your introduction. Thank you all for coming on this uh, very nice October uh, afternoon. Every book not only tells a story, but also has a story. Its origins, its purpose, how it arrived in the world, and so forth. The tale of this one, fittingly enough, starts with a confession. For several years, and for many reasons, I avoided doing a book about Father Hesburgh, though he suggested it from time to time. But a few hours before his funeral, a four-word phrase occurred to me that sounded like it might work as the, a title for a book I might try to do. Those four words are Cigars with Father Ted. On most occasions, when we talked over the years, even for long interviews, he perfumed the air of his office with a cigar. And the image of him at ease, sitting back at his desk and smoking, conveyed a relaxed, informal, conversational tone. The title changed after the book was finished. And the story behind that is, if any of you have ever seen the situation comedy Father Ted, they were afraid that when people would Google Father Ted, they'd end up buying a, a DVD of the situation comedy rather than this particular book. But. The idea of the conversations over cigars provided a sense of unity as I was writing each section. Deciding on the appropriate approach, including the right tone, was one consideration. The next was what material to use. In my long ago youth, I had composed many articles about Father Hesburgh during student days in the 1960s. And I subsequently conducted several lengthy taped interviews with him after I returned in 1980 to teach at Notre Dame. I surveyed everything I had. My long-suffering wife considers my pack rack nature, one of my less endearing characteristics, and put together an outline for a sequence of chapters and just how they might fit together. So four of the five long chapters rely heavily on recorded interviews. And I listen to all of them again to extract new nuggets of wisdom or information. Writing a book is often like doing a puzzle. Where does this piece fit? Should this section go here or should it go there? Does this story even merit a place, etc.? As the pages piled up, I tried to come up with a description of the type of work that was taking shape. The most telling phrase that I could come up with is biographical memoir. Let me explain. The principal focus is indeed biographical. Theodore Martin Hesburgh, his life, his remarkable career, both at Notre Dame and in the world, his thoughts, and so on. But it's also, if you'll pardon the personal intervention, autobiographical, in the sense that it's a memoir of someone observing and interviewing and visiting. 
the principal subject across a span of several decades. The book unfolds chronologically from 1964 until his death in 2015, a full half century. In 1964, Father Hesburgh was 47, 12 years into his presidency at Notre Dame, and already active in civil rights and so many other jobs. And that was the word he always used, the jobs that they gave me away from campus. And in 64, I was a callow teenager, itching at some point in the future to become a reporter or even a writer. By 2015, he was 97, and I was over 65. Garrison Keillor once wrote, you get old and you realize there are no answers, just stories. This book is mostly just some stories. One chapter is called Lessons, Lessons from Friendship. It recounts several vignettes and remembrances of visits to his office and times that we happened to be together. If you will indulge a struggling author, here are the concluding paragraphs of that chapter. In 2010, when Father Hesburgh was 93, we were visiting in his office. He was fidgeting in his chair and had a somewhat troubled look on his face. Can I get you anything, I asked. Can you make me 20 years younger, he responded. The quip is revealing. It concedes that getting older presents its challenges, but it also conveys his desire to turn back the clock so he can keep going. In a way, it says, ah, to be 73 again, <laughs> with two more decades of retirement ahead. A certain satisfaction with life comes across in his question as well. In 1990, God, Country, Notre Dame appeared and became a national bestseller. And he was able to juggle several off-campus responsibilities as well as travel constantly. New doors open without the worry of day-to-day -day administration, and he was happy to walk through them. As his ability to see diminished, however, he was forced to reduce and ultimately bring an end to assignments away from Notre Dame. In the later years, when I saw his work in civil rights or some other area mentioned in a book or an article, I made a point of stopping by to tell him about it. In effect, I became one of his readers, though on an irregular basis. But I drew the line in one respect. After I published a collection of essays, I sent him a copy with a thank you for providing several reports that I used in writing the magazine and newspaper pieces now between hard covers. His letter of acknowledgment included this sentence, quote, if there are specific parts in the book that you think I should read, I would be very happy to have you stop by and read them, which could also lead to a discussion of sorts between us. It was a flattering invitation. Essayists by nature are deluded by ego and vanity, but this request was too much. I couldn't and didn't do it. In one of our long interviews, I asked Father Hesburgh about the notable men and women he'd met over the years. He mentioned presidents of countries, popes, cardinals, astronauts, concluding with a general observation. You cease to be awed. Other people 
are different. In 2006, a few months before Father Hesburgh dictated that note to me, Harper Lee, the author of the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, received an honorary degree from Notre Dame. These two household names with much in common met and she autographed a copy of her classic with this austere yet powerful inscription in her distinctive hand to Father Hesburgh in awe. I shared that feeling even as I got to know him better and we talked more informally about the past and about contemporary affairs. A small dictionary I've consulted for years defines awe as, quote, reverential fear or wonder. No fear ever intruded on our friendship, but I never overcame the wonder. And now we'll have some questions. Sorry about that. Um, one thing in the book uh, is, and, and you just so accurately described it, your unique relationship with Father Hesburgh. Um, how can you describe kind of how your relationship with him developed um, as a student, but then also throughout your career at Notre Dame? Um, how would you characterize it? I was here as a student during the great. Uh, period that he always called the student revolution. And he once told me it was a monumental case of improvisation to deal with campus life during that uh, period. So I'm working for uh, Associated Press at that time, and I would cover all of his press conferences here, and he would have a few every semester to sort of bring people up to date on Notre Dame, but also what he was doing in the uh, realm of civil rights or atomic energy uh, and things like that. And uh, so I would write up the stories. Uh, one time, this is um, somewhat amusing, uh, the power went out at Notre Dame. And I, as the stringer for the AP, immediately got on the horn and called security and fire department and the people over in the, at the power plant and put together a, a little story and um, phoned it in. That's how you did it then. And um, by chance, just by chance, I'm walking by the main building. And it's dark. And this figure is coming down the steps. And I look, and he looks. And it is Theodore Martin Hesburgh, who always, and continued up until the end of his life, um, just automatically speaking to students or whoever was around. And I'll never forget, he said, you know, I was up there, and I burned out the um, mass candles that I had up there doing my work and I couldn't do anything more. And I don't know what's happened. Here he is, the president of the university. <laughs> so here I am, the whatever, 20-year-old uh, stringer for AP. And I said, well, Father, what happened was, and I explained in excruciating detail, that a squirrel had got in and, and, you know, chewed through a wire and the wire hit this and then the capacitor went out and all this stuff. And the look on his face, like, who, what on earth have I opened up here? Uh, and then um, I, I um, quite vividly remember the um, period in the spring of 1970 when you had the invasion of Cambodia and Kent State and, and all of that. 
And um, I don't put this in the book. I didn't think it was right for me. Uh, but I was sort of involved in that and came up with the resolution that kept the students, those who wanted to continue to go to class would go to class, and those who um, decided they wanted to work on other activities could do that. And we had to take it to the uh, academic council, and there he was with Father Joyce here and all the other people. And so um, there, was, there was the student dimension to it. And then not long after I got here, we started to do more with developing journalism and having journalists come to campus. And he loved talking to journalists. You know, they, they could talk that language about what was happening in Washington and all that. And probably what cemented it, and I'll, I'll end it here, is um, in about 1983, the then provost came to me and said, would I write a book about Notre Dame and how it had developed during the Hesburgh years. And uh, think about this. Uh, here I am, untenured, going around to every department and college and trying to find out the mysteries. And the provost made a point of saying, we want the cross currents. We want the tensions. Well, yeah. untenured faculty member writing about tensions. OK, you, could, you, can, you can connect those dots without any uh, problem. Well, anyway, um, so Father Hesburgh and I had a very long interview. And um, he was the only person, only person I interviewed. I interviewed 125 people for that book. And I said, you know, I'm letting everyone that I interview go over their quotes, just to be sure they're saying exactly for a book that Notre Dame was publishing, Notre Dame Press. And he said, I don't want to see it. I trust you. Just do it. And I did it, and thank the Lord, it was um, nicely received by him. He bought 300 copies for his closest friends, <laughs> signed each one. Uh, and from then on, we, um, if I had some fugitive thought for a magazine article or something that I thought he could contribute to, I would do that. And then over time, um, it became less of me asking him. It was him coming and saying, can we talk about some stuff? And I was, you know, very happy to do that. Special relationship. And yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that I think is, is really important to note, and, and we have a video that I'd like to show, is yeah. is Father Hesburgh's role as a member of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. Um, and and the, the video that I'd like to show, and if you could kind of cue it up for us a little sure. bit, um, is his commentary around Lyndon B. Johnson and um, the, the Civil Rights Act. Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, hugely important. and. It, as it turns out, for the sake of this book, 64 is a crucial date um, in his life and my watching him and really observing him closely. And in that summer of 1964, that's when the famous picture of Father Hesburgh and Martin Luther King was taken. And the Civil Rights Act was signed by Lyndon Johnson on July the 2nd of 1964. And then in September of 1964, Father Hesburg received the Medal of Freedom from Lyndon Johnson. And the, he was by far and away the youngest person who received the, uh, the medal that day. Other people, Walt Disney, Helen Keller, Walter Lippmann, Lewis Mumford, uh, Aaron Copeland, uh, and you're going, wow. And so in 2008, quite by chance, I was assigned to teach in the library auditorium. 
And one time we were just chatting and I said, Father, could you, could you imagine coming to the class and talking about the presidents that you had known and your involvement with them and what they were like? And he said, I'd love to. No problem at all. And so um, a very smart uh, student who's now a very, very successful journalist at the Washington Post, Bob Costa, was the head of uh, NDTV. And he, he came to me and he said, do you mind if I videotape your discussion? And I said, oh, no, that's fine. I don't care. And father didn't mind. And uh, so here it was, three cameras. I mean, it's a very, very well done uh, production. And he gets to the point in talking about Lyndon Johnson of how Johnson was able to get the Civil Rights Act passed. And as you um, play it, uh, I'd ask you to um, listen to the way that he um, imitates Lyndon Johnson and think of a priest explaining the tactics, to use a very kind and gentle uh, word, the tactics that Lyndon Johnson used in getting this uh, Civil Rights Act into law. Okay, is that enough of a yes, build up? Yes, thank you. That's great. So, well, this law that we had written that Eisenhower knew he couldn't get passed in any possible way and slipped it on to Kennedy's and the Kennedy's put it in the bottom drawer. Well, when Johnson became president, he knew the senators and the representatives also put it in the bottom drawer. They weren't about to pass this law. And I guess... Johnson decided if I'm going to be known as a good president, I got to do something. And he decided what he was going to do was to get equal rights for black Americans and nowadays Mexican Americans and other foreign Americans. But it, really the problem at that point was black Americans. So we, uh, we were delighted to know that we finally got a president that wasn't trying to avoid the problem, but he was going to push for it. So Johnson became president when Jack was shot in November. Nothing happens over Christmas in Washington the Congress goes home. But the first week of January, with a new Congress that had been elected, and a number of members, not all of them, of course, Johnson called the Senate and the House to meet under the great dome of the executive office building in Washington at the end of the mall. And he had all the senators and all the congressmen, and here's the first time they're going to hear from the new president. And he comes in with a folder in his hand, <clears throat> and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you, you're all going to pass my law takes the folder and he slams it down on the table. And what was inside it was the law that we had proposed as a commission to answer all these problems, no holds barred, to take care of voting, housing, administration of justice, employment, the works. Well, they'd all gotten a copy, of course, of our proposed law, and they'd all shoved it in the bottom drawer. But here's a guy now who was the President of the United States, and he said, y'all gonna vote for my bill, because now it became my bill. And everybody said he's out of his mind. This problem has been around since Jefferson and Lincoln. There's no way on earth it's gonna be solved by one guy in Washington. But they underestimated Johnson. And uh, for the next six months, he was on the phone every night, and he had his little book with all of their foibles, not all there, I mean, senators and congressmen. 
And what he didn't know about him, he could pick up from J. Edgar, who loved to come to the White House for a scotch at 11 o'clock at night, and fill the president on all the things he didn't know about some of the senators and congressmen. So, and Johnson was absolutely uh, ruthless in this pursuit. I, I have to applaud his ruthlessness because it was in a cause where nobody else could possibly have gotten that law through. And here would be a typical way he'd operate. He would ring up, say, Senator X from Mississippi or Alabama or North Carolina. It didn't matter. They were all the same boat. <clears throat> but he wouldn't call them in the daytime or afternoon or early evening. He called them about 3 a.m. I don't know when Johnson slept, but he call him at 3 a.m. in the morning, and you'd hear this guy come on the phone, yeah. and he said, this is your president. And the guy would say, president of what? Now he's coming to wake, and he says, president of these United States. And I called you up, Senator, because I understand you're not going to vote for my bill. Now it became my bill. And he said, Linda, come on. You're a Southerner. I vote for your bill. I cut my throat. And the Johnson said, you've been in the Congress for 35 years, and no one's about to cut your throat. But I'll tell you something. If you don't vote for my bill, I'll cut your throat. Mr. President, that's no way to talk to a U.S. Senator. Well, he says, let's change the scene a bit. Uh, he said, let's say next Thursday, Front page of the Washington Post. Newspaper of record in Washington, D.C. And the headlines is about you, Senator. And it says, what is the senator from Mississippi doing in room 346 of the Mayflower Hotel every Saturday night at 9 o'clock? Is he up there to say the our father was somebody? <coughs> and of course, by now, the senator is outraged. And he said, my God, They'd kill me. He said, you got it right. Better vote for my bill. Bang. <laughs> well, he literally blackmailed everybody that he had something on, and he had something on just about everybody. And believe it or not, having <coughs> dumped that bill in their laps on the first week of January, on the first week of July, he signed the bill, which had been approved by a majority of senators and congressmen. And I swear to you that nobody since him, no president since him, could possibly have gotten that bill through Congress. And he got it through because he was ruthless and because he, he had all the dirt on everybody and he wasn't above threatening them. And he did it person by person. And he did it when he had them at a disadvantage like 3 a.m. in the morning, they're kind of fuddled. But the fact is, the message came through. You either go along with the president, or he's going to get you fired from the, your job as a congressman or a senator. Now that's playing hardball. You don't read much about that in the history books. But that's how it happened. I know that I was there. And I have to say that whatever you say about Lyndon Johnson, I swear to you that no president since, and I've known all of them, could possibly have gotten away with that, could have gotten them to vote for that law. But there's one thing about the United States, and I'm very proud of this. They'll argue about the law, and they'll, there'll be all kinds of ups and downs in politicking, politicking and everything else. But by golly, when the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives sign a bill which is signed by the President, and that becomes law of the United States. Somehow, that's the law. And people like it or don't like it, it's the law, and they follow it. And I would say that the uh, people who are sitting where you're sitting back in the year 1954, or 64, which is over 50 years ago now, they uh, probably could not imagine how that law got passed. And it only got passed because of Lyndon Johnson and being such a tough president. But the fact is that since it was passed, you today don't look on this as a personal 
obstruction of your liberty. You don't look at it as a bad thing, but a good thing. That's such a great video. Yeah. Uh, and such a good... He did that in 2008. And um, what was interesting, that was interesting, his, uh, he had a huge admiration for Dwight Eisenhower. And that comes across very clearly in it. During that whole session, uh, he never once mentioned Ronald Reagan, which I thought was kind of interesting, given the Gipper and Reagan thought he had graduated from Notre Dame. Uh, you know. But um, the other thing about that that was, to me, pretty touching was at the very end, students were leaving. He pulls me aside and says, how was it? I said, oh, Father, it was great. And he says, if you ever sense that I'm slipping and not up to where I should be, let me know. Because I don't want to go out in public and do anything that isn't at the level that you, know, you understand and I understand. Um, so that as he got older, you know, he, he wanted to continue. There was no question about that. Um, but he was also very conscious of um, not being put in a position where he couldn't be Theodore Hesper. Uh, and, and also, I, I think it's important to note, too, I mean, uh, Professor Schmuel has written an article, and yeah. it's in the um, latest Notre Dame magazine, and it's about that. that it is, um, because that, uh, the signing of that bill in 64 was a, a hugely important uh, moment in our political and our national history. And uh, the piece starts with the famous quote of uh, Lyndon Johnson, the day that he signed it, signed the bill. Um, and he says to an aide, and the aide is Bill Moyers, his press secretary, um, we have lost, we, the Democratic Party, we have lost the South for a generation. And up until that time, we had what was affectionately referred to as the solid South for the Democrats. There was the phenomenon of the yellow dog Democrat that a person in the South would vote for a yellow dog uh, just because there was the sense that you went in and you voted uh, Democratic in all ways. And what's interesting is that particular election, Barry Goldwater, along with William Miller, a Notre Dame graduate, as his vice presidential running mate, um, that ticket won five, five or six southern states. And that starts the shift. That does start the geographical shift in our uh, politics. And so think about this. Johnson had worked so hard to get that bill past. And I don't think any of us would dispute its worthiness and greatness. Uh, but he knew that it came at a huge price politically. That the Democratic Party from then on would suffer as a result of that. Yeah. I, as far as uh, Father Hesper's role in, in, in this part of history, mm -hmm. there's so much in the book um, about the societal impact that he had on so many things that was going on in the world from the 60s to the 70s. Right. 80s. I mean, uh, what would you say was his biggest contribution? It's a difficult, it's mm. a difficult one, but could you, could you select one thing that you think would be I, the biggest? I, I mean, I, probably the civil rights, um, because he devoted so much time to that. Remember, um, he was fired. You, you, some of you would, would know that. Um, the Nixon administration fired him. And he had been a member of the Civil Rights Commission since it was founded. 
and Eisenhower appointed him. Uh, so that his appointment ran Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson to uh, Nixon. And the reason that Richard Nixon and the people around him uh, got rid of him was that um, he pushed the Civil Rights Commission, of which he was then chair. Okay, And interestingly, as a side note, Richard Nixon appointed Father Hesburgh as chair of the Civil Rights Commission. He was not until um, Nixon took over as president. And um, what he did was investigate the hiring practices of the federal government. And the report that they released was quite critical of what the um, federal government had done. And the people in the White House um, went ballistic and said, "No, you can't release that. We're coming up on an election. This is, you know, this is bad timing." And he says, "I, I promised the people that this report would be revealed." And so um, I think that's important. He took great pride that he was the first uh, Catholic priest ever appointed an ambassador of the United States and went uh, around the world, as he would say, um, a couple or three times on that mission. Um, what's really uh, remarkable, um, and all of you, I think, would agree, is he is president of the University of Notre Dame and trying to um, see it develop and grow and become a stronger institution, at the same time that he's doing four or five other jobs uh, for the Vatican, our government. He had 16 different presidential appointments. Um, he knew 12 American presidents. There were only 17 during his entire lifetime. Um, so that when uh, when you talk about accomplishments, it was a crowded, uh, a crowded uh, life. Yes. Um, I want to make sure that we sure. allow time for Q&A, but I have one more question. Just to give it some personal context, yeah. um, after Father Hesburgh's retirement, um, what do you think he saw his role as? Um, some big jobs, like you said, but what was his, what was he focused on kind of um, in the, the la latter part of his life? The latter part of his life, uh, after he lost his eyesight, uh, he was totally devoted to Notre Dame. And uh, by that I mean he um, didn't see himself doing anything other than whatever he could do to help the um, university. And um, he would go to his office seven days a week, seven days a week, and um, he loved to interact with the students as he uh, went to his office, always asked them, so what, what are you taking? Who are your teachers? Um, are you uh, enjoying it here at Notre Dame? Uh, that sort of thing. And uh, he never lost that touch and loved to have people come in. He was very much a people-oriented individual. Um, I, quite frankly, and I don't think this is telling anything out of school, um, I think the, the last several years, somewhat lonely, he'd go up there and, you know, if people weren't there, you know, he'd sort of miss that. Um, but he kept straight along uh, having uh, students come to read the newspaper and, and books to him. One time I was uh, picking him up to go to a, a dinner and there was a graduate student sitting there reading about Islam. And um, I was there maybe five or ten minutes early. And I said, hey, Father, here to uh, take you to dinner. And he says, 
you're early. Sit down, he's reading, you might learn something. Uh, so it was that sort of, uh, it was, you know, it was what I found, and I try to emphasize it as much as I can in the, uh, in the book, uh, I found him to be uh, very humorous, yeah, wry, light touch, uh, pretty much, uh, in what he would say. Here's, you know, one of my favorites. Um, we would always, always stop at the grotto, uh, either after a lunch or a dinner, and I'd be driving him back. And uh, one time it was, it was late, maybe 9.30, 10 o'clock, and we always had this one spot where he could sort of see the shimmering of the candles. And we said a prayer or two, and at the end of it, he said, you know, Bob, I should have asked for the candle concession. <laughs> and I said, in my very witty way, if you had, you could have retired to some exotic island by now. And he said, I'd own the island by now. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that's, that was a side of him I don't think a lot of people um, had ever picked up on. Yeah. All right. Do we have any questions? Yeah? I am, please wait for the microphone. Uh, we, we're taping, so I'd like to make sure we get you loud and clear. Thank you. Did he recount many conversations that he had had while waiting for the elevator on the 14th floor next to that wall to wall and ceiling to floor to ceiling painting of Prometheus getting his liver chewed on and Icarus whose wings were melting. That seems like a very interesting place to have a conversation starter waiting for the elevator. He, would, uh, uh, he never stopped having conversations. Um, and as I said before, uh, he, he loved the uh, relationship to students that would be even on that level, sort of at the elevator and, and beyond. One time, uh, near the end, he was still going to the office every day. Um, and I saw this security car, and the Notre Dame police would provide the um, transportation. And I saw it, and I saw it stopped, and I saw a door open, but I, I could see that whoever was in there was having trouble getting out. And it was Father Hesburgh. So I waddled over and um, said, Father, can I give you a hand? And I did. And he gets up, and he turns back to the driver and gives him the most elaborate blessing I have ever witnessed, you know. May your children and their children's children and their children's children, you know, and it went on. And he shut the door, and I said, boy, that was something. And he says, you got to give him something. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was just a, you know, a terrific sort of remark. You've got to give them something. You can't tip them or something. Uh, so since you've been here several decades yourself, yeah. tell us about how the school has evolved in terms of uh, the presence of African Americans. Is the, has it, because someone was, that I talked to yesterday um, was just saying it's remarkable to him that it, in terms of African Americans, not if you ex excluding student athletes, he thought the population was relatively low. I don't know if that was just an off-base observation or how it's ebbed and flowed over time, if you have any perspective. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the great, um, what would you say, not regrets, that's a little too strong, but uh, for Father Hesburg, as someone who was so involved in civil rights, the, the percentage of African Americans at Notre Dame, and especially non-athletes, uh, was not that high. And he always worked 
to uh, increase that. I think I am right in saying, and some of you might know the exact uh, details, but I am pretty certain that what I'm telling you uh, is a fact. And that is that when Notre Dame broke the string of not going to bowl games, remember that back in about 70? That's pretty close. Um, that the money from the bowl game was to be devoted to a scholarship fund for minority students. Does that sound right to, to people? Bob, out there, does that sound right? Um, so that they were very conscious, he was very conscious of that uh, situation and tried to do what, whatever he could to um, improve it. Um, but he would say, you know, there's certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. And the same would be true of the hiring of uh, minority faculty members, which um, I can, I, you know, I've had enough um, time in administration to know how seriously uh, the main building takes that as an issue. Uh, so that's, that's really as good as I can do. I mean, there would be a very good uh, percentage of Latino students on this campus now. Uh, and that has been uh, a concerted effort to um, bring them here. Bob, apparently you have gotten tenure if you're holding a chair in, in American. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it, it's got wheels on it. Uh, and it folds, so. Uh, My question yeah. isn't about Father Ted, but about Father Ned. Yeah. And the title of your chair. Yeah. Because oh, I, uh, I can't figure out any connection that Walter Annenberg would have with the university unless it was an admiration for Father Huge, Ned huge. I, I'd love to tell that story. Um, uh, Father uh, Hesburgh and Father Joyce were very close to the Annenbergs, Mr. and Mrs., and uh, dealt with them uh, over the years. And um, Mr. Annenberg died well before the time that uh, Father Joyce did. And um, people here at Notre Dame, I would be one of them, uh, thought that it would be a way of memorializing their friendship would be a chair that brought together Father An or Father Annenberg. That's a great one. Uh, <laughs> he's going to have to convert first. Uh, Walter Annenberg and Father Joyce. And uh, Father Hesburg was so much behind that. Um, and they were close. Uh, by that I mean the Annenbergs. I happen to be, God, this sounds like name dropping, and it's not. Uh, but I was on an Annenberg commission in 2004. And we had a meeting out in Marancho Mirage, California, and indeed a reception and dinner at the Annenberg estate. And there were 25 of us, say on this commission. And there was a receiving line. And um, you introduced yourself. And I said, I'm Bob Small from Notre Dame. And Mrs. Annenberg says, Notre Dame. And she stops the receiving line and takes me to her study, where there is a picture of her being kissed, forgive me, by two Holy Cross priests. <laughs> And she said, this is my picture of the kissing Padres. And it was Father Hesburgh and it was Father Joyce on the QE2, which they had uh, taken uh, on a trip X number of years before. So they were close. And um, you know, we have the Annenberg Auditorium over in the Snight Art Museum. And I think, and you know, it, Anybody knows? I think that Mr. Annenberg gave a, an endowment 
for the upkeep of the uh, Joyce Athletic and Convocation Center. But it was all sort of a personal relationship between, between them. Um, Professor, you reference yeah. in the book. Uh, first of all, great book. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. For being here. Um, Professor, you talk in the book about um, uh, during the um, um, challenging times of Vietnam, him going to the board and wanting to resign. What, what, what was his state of mind? Did, did he feel he failed? Did he feel he lost control of the students? What, wh where was he coming from at that point in his, in his life? I think, uh, thank you uh, for the question. I think at that time he felt so beset from so many different sides um, that he did not quite know what direction Notre Dame was going to take during this period. And he also had so many other concerns outside the campus. And I think it was, uh, quite frankly, a moment where he looks at himself and says, well, now, maybe it would be best if somebody else would, uh, would do this for a while. And remember, that was in about 68. And he had been president since 52. And so it, it had been a, a fairly long period. Um, and what he wanted out of it, and I think that's in the book as well, um, is he was floating the idea that Notre Dame would have a chancellor. And if some of you are, are familiar with university administration, a chancellor is in effect sort of a ceremonial position and less of a day-to-day -day, uh, kind of thing, at least in, in many uh, cases. And I think by seeing the possibility of a chancellorship, University of Notre Dame, he could continue to do the other things as well as represent uh, the university. But I suspect most of you were aware that there was the legendary joke um, that, you know, what's the difference? between God and Father Hesburgh. God is everywhere, and Father Hesburgh is everywhere except Notre Dame. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that was, see, that was, when I was a student, what we would say. The, the uh, statue of Moses, you know, pointing, you know. It's not we're number one. It was, there goes Hesburgh. Uh, so I, I think it was that, I, at that time. And, and maybe he was uh, looking for a little more support from people around here that if you, you know, if you say you're going to leave and you're very valuable, then other people begin to sort of uh, do things. But he was, he was tortured by the late 60s. He really was and um, could feel it did not want to see Notre Dame explode, uh, would, would be in his office and uh, would be visiting with students if they came by. His, his idea was keep the door open. When he was there, keep the door open uh, so that he could um, you know, try to work things out. I say in, in, the, in the book, um, he, he always made a point of talking about it, that he kept a slip of, of paper in his wallet, and it was the names of the presidents of colleges and universities who either died or forced to retire or, or resign during the 60s because it was such a difficult uh, time. I think, unfortunately, we're out of, of time for any okay. more questions. But we wanted to uh, thank you for your time oh, well, today. Thank, thank you for joining us. Mandy. This is from our Notre Dame Family Wines. So no. on behalf of I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the Notre Dame Alumni Association, we want to say thank you very much.
Thank you.